Okay, so today I'm joined by Congressman Jamie Raskin, who just won his race. So congratulations on your reelection. Thank you, Brian. You were the only person I wanted to speak to as a constitutional law professor, a former constitutional law professor, uh, because there are a lot of questions. Now that Joe Biden has, has won his race, what levers Donald Trump has at his disposal? Because if there's one thing we know about the guy, it's that he's uh, not, not into losing or uh, humility. So the first question I, I think is, is the scariest, and that is, can, can you speak about this idea of faithless electors and whether electors can disregard the will of a state's voters? Ah, well, a faithless elector is one who d- d- votes uh, outside of the instruction of uh, the person they're pledged to vote for. Um, but, and there have been cases of faithless electors, a, a couple dozen over American history, <clears throat> but it's extremely unusual and it's extremely unlikely in this election because the candidates choose their own electors. In other words, in Maryland, the Democratic slate of electors has been chosen by the Democratic Party. It's been vetted by the Biden campaign and the same has taken place with the Republicans and the Trump campaign. So uh, that, that's not a worry anybody should have. So is it basically that there is a slate of Democratic electors and a state of Republican electors? And once, you know, the, the state's citizens have cast their votes, only those people from the party that they've cast their votes for is able to actually choose the, the person that they're, that they're you know, selecting as president. When you go to vote uh, for Biden or Trump, you're actually voting for the electors that have been assigned to Trump or to Biden for your state. And so when Biden wins in Maryland, those electors will be certified as the winners to participate in the Electoral College when it meets on December the 14th. And then they will be, uh, their votes will be sent to Washington and cast when we're in a joint session of Congress on January the 6th. So the faithless electors, uh, the many things you might worry about is not something that should be high up on the list. That's good to know because we do have a bunch of, you know, Trump mouthpieces. I think we have Mark Levin on Fox News that's demanding that the electors, uh, you know, that the legislatures basically disregard the will of the American people. Is, is that along the same lines? Well, okay, that's a different problem. Okay. And and they are, I mean, that would be a truly extraordinary thing to do, but we know that there are Republicans that have been kicking this around. What they would do is falsely cry chaos, corruption, and fraud in a particular state, say Pennsylvania or Georgia or Arizona or whatever it might be, and then get a Republican-controlled legislature to overturn the popular results, essentially nullify the election and repeal the existing state election law. They would then quickly, hastily scramble to pass a new election law, and under that law, appoint presidential electors for Trump or split them between Trump and Biden. Uh, I mean, in other words, their goal here would either be to get Trump to win or to get some kind of 269 to 269 tie, throwing it into the House of Representatives for a contingent election. Right. And I know we had spoken last time and you actually pointed out and, and taught me and a lot of people that um, it, it's when the election goes back to the House, it's not, okay, well, Democrats control the House. It's actually uh, the House with regard to state legislatures and Republicans have a majority in those state legislatures. If there were to be a contingent election in the House, we would not vote, you're right, one member, one vote, but we would vote one state, one vote, one state delegation. So the California delegation, those 53 people would have one vote for president and the one person in Montana would have one vote for president. So there are 50 votes entire in the House. And so right. that, would, that, that would be the, elector, the new electoral terrain. So obviously the likelihood of something like this situation that you just mapped out in Pennsylvania happening uh, you know, at the behest of Trump's mouthpieces is, is extremely unlikely and would- Well, Pennsylvania, it's pretty much gone away because yesterday the Republican majority leader of the state Senate Um, issued a statement saying that there would be no attempt to repeal the existing election law and to overturn the popular result in Pennsylvania. And uh, he wrote an op-ed to that effect as well. So I think Pennsylvania is not promising for them. Um, And um, 
you know, there are some other states where they could try it. But again, it's only effective if that state's electoral package would make the difference. So they could do it in Arizona. But if we've won in Pennsylvania and Georgia, it would be irrelevant to the ultimate count. Yeah. And then, by the way, the fact that we even have to talk about this is just a, a testament to how far the Republican Party under Trump has fallen, uh, especially with regard to, you know, how they how these constitutionalists uh, value our democracy. Yeah, I mean, it demonstrates tremendous disrespect for democracy and our essential constitutional norms. So, um, but but we do we will have to replace the Electoral College sooner rather than later, because, you know, essentially to more or less extent, every presidential election this century, beginning with 2000 in Bush versus Gore, all the way up through this one in 2020, has involved a lot of electoral college drama for no reason. Yeah. Um, you know, Biden's going to end up with somewhere between five and six million more votes than Trump. Why don't we just elect the president the way we elect the governor, yeah. senator, mayor, congressperson? Well, that's that's coming from someone who values uh, democracy, and I think we only have about half of the uh, half of those in Washington right now who are who are uh, on the same on the same track as you. So I do want to talk about the Supreme Court now. From the beginning, we've heard and and Trump's broadcast this on numerous occasions that his goal here is to have installed Amy Coney Barrett onto the Supreme Court to have a six three conservative court to try to win the election that way. So, are there routes for Trump to challenge election results? in the Supreme Court? No, not at all. I mean, you know, the, the comical thing is that the country now understands this. You know, when Trump went out on election night and began raving like a lunatic about how he'd won the race and it, right. and it was all fraud and everything. What was amazing to me was how little anybody was moved by that outside of Fox News. And even there, people understood it was essentially fraudulent. So people understand the president doesn't have any role in it. it. The states do the counting. Uh, they have a state electoral system and apparatus set up with the secretary of state and the boards of election. And then all of the electors meet and then the electoral college votes are sent to Congress in a joint session. And there's a whole procedure set forth in the Electoral Count Act of 1887 governing the receipt and the counting of electoral college votes. And if worse comes to worse comes to worse, it goes to the House of Representatives. It's got nothing to do with the president. So, I mean, he was basically like, you know, a, a guy you see out yelling in the street at two o'clock in the morning. Right. Uh, I mean, it, it was irrelevant. <laughs> Keeping on that same track of these court cases that we've seen, again, we've been so worried about uh, litigation, uh, Trump presenting litigation and that being some avenue for him to, to, to steal an election. But the litigation that we've seen so far in Georgia was over this issue of 53 ballots that they said came in late and the judge dismissed that case. In Michigan, it was that uh, that the Trump campaign wanted self-ordained poll observers to come in. And the, and the judge literally said, do you have a uh, you know, people representing your campaign already in that room? And the campaign said, yeah. And then the judge said, what are we here for? And so that case was dismissed. In Philadelphia, there was another case with the same deal. They wanted poll observers to come in. That was dismissed. So, I mean, it goes to, to show that all this, this hype about uh, uh, Trump using the courts as an avenue to kind of circumvent the will of the American people has dramatically fallen on its face. The, you know, the, the complete incompetence of the Trump team is what saves us from the malice and the evil of the Trump team. Because they clearly would like to bring it down, but rather than picking their shot the way that the clever Republican lawyers did in 2000 in Bush versus Gore and zeroing in on one intrinsically ambiguous thing, which is, are the counties using the same standards? Which of course they're not, that's the basis of the whole system, but they exploited that and then some pictures of holding people holding ballots up to the light to create the sense that something right. you know, was going off. Um, in any event, if there was a problem, it should have contaminated the whole election. But they used it to say, well, you know, we'll leave well enough alone and just say no more counting going forward. That was phony in itself. But the Republican lawyers were clever then because they zeroed in on one thing. What you got from Donald Trump and his people is just the kitchen sink in, you know, right a bunch of states and a bunch of different weak claims. And so they just begin to undermine each other over and over. And at this point, uh, nobody's listening to them. Right. That's a, you know, that's he's, a, the, he's the president who cried fraud. Yeah. 
yeah, starting on, on before he even took office. I mean, the, right. the issue with the president claiming illegitimate votes in an election that he literally won, you know, is that when when he wants to to cry fraud in this election, it's like you've been, you know, we've heard this song and dance for, for the last four years and it doesn't it doesn't move anybody anymore. I do want to talk about and, and this is a question I get a lot. It's about the issue of pardons. So I want to clarify for Trump to issue pardons. Doesn't someone need to have been charged with something first? Um, the, that's a legally ambiguous. So whether or not you could just give a, a blanket pardon going forward, we don't have a case on that. Let's say somebody like Louis DeJoy, for example, he hasn't been charged with anything, but there's clearly legal exposure given everything that's going on. So, I mean, without Louis DeJoy having, having, you know, been indicted with it, maybe without priority and investigation having even been opened, yes. would it be possible for Trump to preemptively protect him? Well, when you ask whether it's possible for Trump to do something, you know the answer to that. Trump will do whatever he <laughs> wants. So he will certainly write out a piece of paper that says he pardons Louis DeJoy presently and forever hereafter for yeah. anything he might have done. That's Hereby. a federal offense. That's right. Trump, Trump he, thinks that he, he uses the uh, elevated language it make, on Twitter. It makes it official. Right. And everybody knows it doesn't work for state criminal prosecution. The question is whether... A, pro, a prospective pardon for offenses that have not been charged yet would be a get out of jail free card going in. I mean, the standard understanding is absolutely not because then that essentially tells somebody you can commit whatever crimes you want. Right. Um, but, but we just, I mean, it's so extreme. We don't have a case on that. Okay. Um, an another question that I get a lot is, on a self pardon. So would, would Trump be able to pardon himself? So if, if investigations are ongoing, would, would a self pardon, I mean, it's along the same lines as what you just said, but w could that preclude him from facing accountability? So yeah, again, there's nothing to, to you know, keep him from printing out a piece of paper where he says, I hereby pardon myself for any crimes charged or as yet uncharged committed as president uh, within the federal system. Um, with, you know, there's obviously a, there's been a there's a scholarly dispute about that. And there's been recently a, a partisan dispute about it. The, the Democrats say, because we had a hearing about this in the Judiciary Committee, that it's absolutely absurd. You can't pardon uh, yourself. That defeats the whole idea of what a pardon is. And it's not happened and it should not be recognized. Uh, the Republicans are essentially advancing the idea that there is no limitation on the pardon power. We know that that's not right. I mean, for one thing, there's a limitation on the ability of the president to pardon people in the state system. But there's also the idea that the president could not go on eBay and say, I'm, I'm um, passing out pardons for $100,000 a pop. That would be bribery. Um, and so not only could it be prosecuted for that, I think that any pardon issued in that fashion would be considered null and void. I do want to speak about the Senate. Now, uh, as far as we know, and as of this recording, it looks like the Senate, uh, even if we aren't able to take the races in Alaska and North Carolina, that we still have the opportunity to take two seats in Georgia. And obviously Georgia uh, in, in, in recount territory now, but, but uh, you know, one, one would imagine that that is a state that we were able to, to flip when all is said and done. Um, that, that Senate race, those two Senate races, John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock are going to a runoff on January 5th. Now, if we don't take the Senate, what legislatively would be off the table? Almost everything. And so what are we able to accomplish? Well, I mean, I think that there's been enough heat put on Mitch McConnell um, that we will get another relief package, right? It's going to be like pulling teeth to make it meaningful for the American people and to get the states and the counties and the schools, the aid that they need to get unemployed people, the aid that they need. And we want to make it retroactive and, you know, go back to all of these months that people haven't been earning anything. So we're going to have a huge debate on our public philosophy, but there are a number of special interest giveaways and grab bags that I know he's interested in. Um, so we're going to deal with that. But look, remember, McConnell was the guy who said when President Obama was being sworn in, his major goal was to prevent Obama from making anything happen, right. from allowing anything to happen. And then um, under Trump, he was very willing to do nothing right. uh, other than sit there and 
pack the courts with hundreds of Trump judges. Legislatively speaking, if, if we're in a situation where we only have the House, I know that um, basically it's anything that has to do with the budget. And if I'm not mistaken, the ACA was was passed as a as a as a budgetary issue. So so what basically would our agenda be limited to in the House? Well, remember, we've got 600 bills that are sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk right now, including H.R. 8, which is the universal background check on all violent criminals for the sale of firearms. H.R. 1, which abolishes gerrymandering and institutes uh, nonpartisan independent redistricting panels in every state. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act to end all of the tactics of voter suppression and throwing people off the rolls and so on. All of those things are sitting on McConnell's desk. We will pass them again and see if we can negotiate to get them to do some stuff. But I mean, you know, with Mitch McConnell, you are dealing with uh, one of the great obstructionists of all time. I mean, he likes to call himself the Grim Reaper because right. he presides over a legislative graveyard. I think that should just go to underscore the importance as we approach these these runoffs in Georgia, just how important it is, you know, from everything from climate change legislation to voting rights legislation, HR1, to, to make uh, election day a holiday, to stop these voter suppression efforts and, and, uh, and stop foreign interference, all the way to, you know, making sure that we protect uh, health care in this country to, to protect a woman's right to, you know, choose what she does with her own body. So all of that stuff is on the line. So, um, you know, that just kind of underscores just how important uh, uh, these Senate races in, in January really are. Yeah, Georgia is the whole thing. And, you know, that will be a battle royale for the future of democracy and our ability to get any legislation passed over the next two years. And we're going to have to put it on those terms to make people understand that's what it's about. I woke up this morning with... Uh, Georgia on my mind. And so I, I played it and I sent it to my Georgia colleagues to thank them for everything they've been doing to rescue American democracy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we see over and over again, too. I mean, a lot of these, uh, the, the difference in this election was, uh, was these votes coming out of uh, Savannah and Atlanta. It's mostly people of color. So yet again, you know, uh, people of color have, have, have come to the rescue and saved us from, from what has been uh, the worst authoritarian episode in American history. So uh, that's something to, to, to remember. I do have one, one last question. This is something that I get frequently too. And that is that in the event that Trump doesn't physically leave and just keeps claiming a rigged election, <laughs> who specifically is charged with removing the guy? Well, that's an awesome question. And I know that's given people nightmares, but that's <laughs> one that doesn't, doesn't bother me so much because that's what the Secret <laughs> right. Service is for. That's what the U.S. Marshals are for. Um, you know, the police power is going to belong to Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, and the executive branch of government. And there's a lot of police officers uh, around the president of the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, if he were, if he wanted to be dragged kicking and screaming out of the White House, uh, like, um, you know, a squad or someplace, I suppose he yeah. could, it would be the ultimate humiliation and embarrassment at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, we're very clear that uh, if he really wanted to try to perpetrate a military coup, he shouldn't have started by insulting everybody in the military <laughs> and everybody yeah. who's ever served in the military as being uh, a fool and a sucker. Uh, so yeah. he hasn't much set the grounds for a successful military coup. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a great point. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. It is always, you know, fascinating to, 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 to hear from you. So uh, um, I hope we can have you back soon. Pleasure's all mine, Brian. Stay close, man. 